Good evening. It's uh, August 1st at 6.30. Welcome to the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting. Could we have the roll, please? Mr. Robinson? Here. Mr. Cange excused. Ms. Barker? Here. Mr. Strike? Here. Mr. Spring excused. Mr. Walker? He should be here, so hopefully. Mr. Spinelli? Here. Mr. Sporhays? Here. Ms. Bailey? Here. Thank you. Any disclosures, Ms. Bailey? Uh, I was not uh, present for the items on the consent agenda, so I will not be voting on those. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Strike? Andre? No disclosures. Okay. Mitzi? Nothing to disclose. Brandon? None, thank you. And, and I have none also. Um, moves us to the consent agenda. Um, can I have a motion to adopt the consent agenda? Thank you, Mr. Strike. Ms. Barker, any discussion on the consent agenda? Hearing none, the consent agenda is approved. Um, before we get into the uh, case 2016-0066, could I get a motion to postpone the other item on our agenda indefinitely? Thank you, Ms. Barker and Mr. Strike. Um, any objection to postponing indefinitely? Hearing none, that is postponed. I assume, can I ask staff, that means that when that does come back, it comes to us as a complete application uh, and noticed all over again. Is that right? That is correct. It'll come back as a complete application. And I know I've had neighbors of mine asking uh, me about that case. Uh, is there any, any knowledge as to when it'll come back to us or? The last I'd heard it was they would they hoped it would be heard sometime in September, but we have not received the the actual plan modifications that they were working on yet. Very good, thanks, Terry. Okay, that moves us to the uh, the only item on our agenda this evening, case 2016-0066, State of Alaska DOT uh, Contact Sensitive Solutions Transportation Project Site Plan Review for Windy Corner, the design study report. Um, could we have a, a staff report followed by the petitioner, please? And I would remind folks, I, we told, I told you informally, but this is not a public hearing item, so just to let you know that. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a request for approval of the draft design study report for the Seward Highway, milepost 105 to 107, known as uh, Windy Corner. Uh, the transportation project process includes the uh, context-sensitive solutions concept report, uh, which has already been heard by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, that's an informational item. Now we are moving towards the draft design study report, which uh, is uh, the alternatives development evaluation, uh, screening criteria, and an alternative decision by the Planning and Zoning Commission. Sean, I'm just going to interrupt yeah. you just for a second, just to note for the record that Mr. Walker has joined us. Thank you. Sorry to disrupt your. Uh, oh. That's okay. Do we need to? Do you need to do disclosures or anything? No. Any disclosures, Brandon? On we're on the. Uh, no, we're good. Keep okay. Going. Uh, the primary objective of the of the design study report is to document engineering design decisions uh, based on the existing conditions, design standards, uh, environmental considerations, and other areas to the project preliminary project development. The draft uh, study report conforms to AMC 2103-190. Uh, the, the stu this study addresses 13 points in the review and found there are three primary reasons for the proposed improvements to this segment of the Seward Highway. Uh, it's design safety corridor with a history of elevated crash severity. Uh, the purpose of the, and the need for the project are driven by improving corridor s safety. And the existing uh, average daily traffic during the summer months exceeds 22,000 vehicles a day and it's forecasted to increase. The highway design standards conform to all applicable publications. Let's see here. Uh, alternative two is the preferred alternative and effectively addresses both safety and capacity. Uh, this second alternative will improve road safety by realigning the existing two-lane highway to meet the 65 mile per hour design cr criteria and the reconstructed two-lane highway will have eight foot wide outside shoulders and tw with 12 foot wide travel lanes and a four foot inside shoulder in each direction. Um, the railroad track will also be located uh, further out into the inlet, a minimum of 42 feet from uh, the center line to the edge of the highway pavement. Uh, the project is being completed using a combination of state and federal funds with right-of-way acquisition planned to begin later this year into the 2017 uh, with construction beginning 
to between 2017 and 2019. Uh, the, the, the proposed uh, improvements require acquisition of approximately 34 and a half acres from the Chugach State Park, but 17.5 acres of the old road right away are going to be relinquished to the state park back. Uh, so we have lighting proposed for just the pedestrian underpass. Uh, maintenance will remain the responsibility of DOT while the part, pedestrian and parking facilities will be maintained by DNR. Uh, the DOT project team has attended numerous public meetings and open houses and maintained a project website to inform and include the local community, organizations, stakeholders, and others about public involvement. Let's see, departmental comments. We had a comment from the traffic department. Uh, traffic engineering considers each parking area to be separate parking facilities. So as a result, the correct number of accessible parking spaces should be provided for each parking area, and that's based on the total number of spaces. Building safety has also commented um, that the vertical rockery walls shall, shall be specifically designed for seismic forces. Um, they, they included a, a pretty lengthy comment there. Uh, the department recommends approval of the alternative two of the draft design study report for Seward Highway, subject to the conditions found on page eight and nine. Uh, and I'd also like to note that the there's been some question about the uh, natural resource extraction, and that would be a conditional use that would come back before the planning and zone com zoning commission once the state makes the application. So that is something that would be a public hearing on a natural resource extraction permit through uh, basically a conditional use at a later date. Uh, the petitioner and petitions representatives are here tonight to answer any questions that you may have. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, any questions of staff? Mr. Stray. Yeah, I, I should have tabbed my booklet here, but in my first read, I remember seeing the notation about this being the in the Seward Highway beautification or visual site parameters and so forth. What, what's the right terminology for that? Scenic byway. Scenic byway. Does that, does that designation have any influence or considerations on this project? Is there something within that designation that we need to be aware of as it impacts this project? Uh, through for the for our code there's n nothing really that states uh, anything with the national state scenic byway and all American road okay. however there may be some sort of national or state I, I guess I'd, yeah, I'd ask you a different question since I, I understand that program to be you know somewhat voluntary you figure out if you qualify for it or not is there any due diligence that that you have done that has determined whether or not that there's any then you know rules or recommendations once you have that that uh, label there's there's nothing within the scenic byways in terms of uh, re regulations or specific requirements uh, we we are there are none of those but it is a consideration mm -hmm. for uh, improvements that are along that corridor thanks anything else mr. strike that's good any, any other questions of staff before we bring the petitioner forward Final one, just um, could you remind us, uh, this is the design study report, could you, could you remind us our role here this evening um, as well as what follows be after this step in terms of road design? Oh, sure, Mr. Chair. So it's the uh, draft design study report right now in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. As I said, it's uh, to, to look at the alternatives, development, evaluation of those alternatives, um, and uh, make a decision on, on that, which alternative would be best. Uh, it also moves on from here to the uh, plans in hand, which is uh, Urban Design Commission, and that's the approval of the plans at 65% stage to include a landscaping theme. Does that, does that answer your question? It does. Do, do any of the steps along the way um, have uh, public hearings as part of a normal, normal course of things? I mean, is it, I, can't, I know that sometimes we make these uh, public hearings. This one is not, and they typically are not. Is the, is the UDC a public hearing, or is that also not a public hearing? Uh, it, it is not a public hearing. However, um, we do take in uh, comments comment. during the comment period. Okay. Yeah, and that's what we suggest. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite the petitioner forward for your presentation, and, uh, and then any questions. Good evening. 
Uh, my name is Tom Schmidt. I'm uh, the DOT project manager. Yes, and I'm Steve Noble, uh, Dallas project manager. So, want me to take over? <laughs> okay. Hello. So uh, we do have a brief presentation. Uh, many of you uh, have been on the Planning and Zoning Commission when this project was previously presented, and so I'll I'll try to uh, refresh your memories on uh, for those that are new to the commission. Uh, this is the this is largely the same project that was previously presented, but there was uh, enough differences in the project that it was deemed necessary to come back and obtain PNZ approval again. Uh, and so uh, we'll review the project, and if you have any questions, we'll be available to answer them. So we'll start out by uh, uh, em emphasizing uh, kind of what we are, what the project includes, which is largely. Uh, I'll have to stay over here so you can hear me. Uh, it's uh, two lanes in each direction. That's one of the ch uh, sig more significant changes since we were uh, came back to you last time was that there was one lane in each direction previously. Now there are two lanes in each direction through the majority of the project length. It widens out. And instead of having kind of a series of auxiliary lanes uh, entering each of the turnouts and then exiting each of the turnouts uh, and then acceleration lanes, that kind of uh, uh, lane configuration was deemed to be a, bur a bit of a maintenance burden uh, by DOT. And so the, the decision was made instead to have two lanes. One will be a through lane, one will be an auxiliary lane, which will be primarily used for turning in and out of these existing facilities. It will also be for acceleration. It could also be for passing. Uh, so it's really kind of a multi-purpose lane in this area. Uh, so the, the, the actual alignment of the road has not changed since that original configuration. We just uh, have taken a bit of the width out of the median to provide space for that additional lane width. So there is still uh, one uh, existing, there's still one proposed uh, left turn pocket which is in the in the southbound direction, there's a left turn lane that enters, uh, enables southbound traffic to be able to turn directly into the recreational area on the north side of the road. Uh, so this project is largely a, uh, a project to resolve the geometric issues uh, between the milepost 105 to 107. Uh, in order to provide space for realigning the road, we had to realign the railroad tracks uh, out into the inlet. And we're fixing two curves that are uh, that don't meet current standards. That's the primary objective of the project: is to fix the geometry of the road, uh, in order to also accommodate uh, the recreational users and the and the and the scenic wildlife viewing in the area. The department is working with the Department of Natural Resources to uh, develop the two scenic turnouts on each side of the road. The one primarily on the south side, in the southbound direction, uh, that. Uh, in the southbound direction, Tom, can you point to it? The, that one is only accessible coming southbound. And then in the northbound, and then on the north side of the highway, that, that scenic area will be accessible from both directions. And you will be able to turn out of that northern uh, turn uh, uh, recreational area f uh, to go both directions. So we have a, we have a divided highway, two 12-foot lanes in both directions, shoulders that meet current standards. We have the railroad tracks separated from the travel lanes a sufficiently far distance uh, so that uh, we meet the railroad's uh, standards and their requirements for realigning the railroad. Uh, and then we have uh, separated far enough away from, uh, from the mountainside so that we've got sufficient distance for our rock catchment uh, and to provide uh, and really to provide space for a future trail, although there's not a trail included in this project on that north side of the road. There are pedestrian facilities that link the two recreational areas uh, that go, and it's a pedestrian undercrossing. That pedestrian undercrossing remains, uh, and uh, it's essentially a culvert undercrossing th uh, through the road embankment. Uh, and then there is also a pedestrian link that continues down the south side of the road embankment and then crosses underneath the railroad tracks, uh, which, is, uh, which, is, which provides pedestrian access but is primarily an emergency access ramp for 
uh, emergency services. We've been working with the fire department, and uh, they have uh, endorsed our plan to provide them a, a, this is really the only place between the Port of Anchorage and 20 Mile River where they have a, uh, a place where they can access the inlet uh, when there's an emergency. And so we've been working with them on how they can drive down and be able to act, get get their jet skis or whatever else they need to get wave runners uh, out onto the inlet for if there's a case of an emergency. So uh, we can move. Uh, a key consideration to this design is the coastal riprap. We are just working with the railroad to design that. It's a very, very large uh, four, four or five foot diameter riprap that's got to be outside there to help make sure that we don't have uh, erosion of the, the railroad facilities. We turn to the next one. Uh, in general, uh, we wanted to talk a little bit about the layout of the two parking areas. We'll start with the one on the north side. Uh, one of the, uh, we're, we're, the, we've been working closely with the Chugach State Park to determine the layout of these uh, parking facilities to provide the size, the number of spaces. Uh, it is intended that there will be bathroom facilities at, at this parking area. You'll see two different colors on the, on the drawing there. The, one, the, air, the lighter gray is actually a paved uh, parking area with uh, paved walkways uh, where the yellow lines are. And then there's a darker gray, which is just a gravel uh, parking area, which is really overflow. Uh, and then we've also identified it as a potential place where they could land a helicopter or something else if there was an emergency response needed in that area. Um, and so, again, we're trying to, trying to make wise use of the funds, trying to make sure we have a, an area that's consolidated that can be maintained uh, uh, during the summer months. And then in the winter months, it's envisioned that, that there will be an entry gate uh, that will be able to close off the, the uh, access to this area when they can't maintain it. There is going to be inf or, uh, informational kiosks. We're going to take advantage of the rock uh, that existing rock area there and it's going to remain and there'll be uh, viewing platforms up on top of the rock and uh, there'll be a, uh, some scenic elements there that we'll, that we'll be presenting later in the design process. Next. So you can see how that pedestrian pathway routes from the northern, ac northern parking area, goes under the highway and then routes along to uh, a similar viewing platform and a parking area, which is a much smaller parking area in the southbound direction. It's largely uh, taking the place of the existing one that exists there today. It's similar number of spaces, uh, but, is, uh, but, but it's separated from the highway more than the current one is. There is a vertical element to that, plat to that parking area from the railroad tracks. Turn, if we can turn the next, you can get a bit, uh, before I turn the page, I guess you can get a little better idea of what the what that uh, emergency access area is. It's, it really is, we really have very limited distance there between the elevation of the railroad tracks and the high tide line. We have just a very, just the bare minimum distance to, to be able to get under the tracks there and still provide the emergency services the distance that they need to get out there. Uh, we've been working with the railroad closely to try to make it so that uh, there, that we can discourage trespass across the tracks. That's been a problem in the existing facilities. And so there is going to be this kind of viewing platform with a, with a barrier rail and a rockery wall. So there'll, there'll be a, a much harder area for them to just cross. And we, if, they, if they are going to cross, we want them to go down the ramp and under, under the tracks rather than, go, rather than going up and over. Next. Just wanted to give you some idea visually of of the right-of-way acquisition, um, really, it's a uh, really it's a, a re-permitting of the of the right-of-way. The orange area indicates an area that will be uh, relinquished back to the park, uh, and it's largely that recreation area and the existing uh, existing highway alignment. Uh, and then there's a larger area which is uh, largely mud flats today, and the Gorilla Rock area, wh which encompasses the space that's necessary for realigning. The railroad tracks and uh, and this uh, much of the uh, Tree Gate State Park is is uh, was 
uh, is encumbered by the Land and Water Conservation Fund program, and so we have been working through a process with Chugach State Park and through DNR and National Park Service to to uh, do a land conversion so that we're, this project can proceed and this uh, this reassignment of the right of way between the two uh, entities will will proceed. Next. So uh, the last uh, graphic we have here indicates uh, two of the, the two primary material sites uh, that we've uh, advanced as far as it, to the investigation phase for the project. We did do a thorough evaluation of material sites from Portage to the Matsu Valley, uh, trying to find uh, and identify feasible alternatives for finding material. Uh, the realignment of the of the railroad tracks and the highway th through uh, out into the inlet is about a 50 foot deep fill, and we're estimating about 1.8 million cubic yards of material is needed to make uh, to realign the highway and the and the railroad tracks. Uh, there are there are no existing sources with that material available uh, in close proximity to this site. Uh, and there are no sites down close to Portage that have that material available. Uh, and so the department went through a fairly exhaustive uh, investigation of potential sites in that, that we could develop a material site. We looked at milepost 104, we looked at milepost 109. Uh, well, the milepost 109 material site has the, has the quality and the quantity of material that's necessary to, to do the project and, and we can develop this project with just the one material site, not both. The 104 site uh, probably has some quality, rock quality issues, which, are, which is why we have uh, leaned towards the milepost 109 uh, site. And, uh, uh, and we're working with Chugach State Park to uh, get that material site permitted for the project. Uh, and with that, I'll open it up to any questions. Greg. Yes, thank you, and through the chair. Recreational users using this area, are we talking about the windsurfers, kite surfers, hikers, um, kayakers? What are we talking about? It's really all of the above. We've heard from just about everyone. Uh, it's... it's it's really kind of astounding how much recreational use this area gets. There's access, if we could go back to the... So it's, it's, it's people that are sightseeing, it's people that are wanting to get access to the Turnigan Arm Trail. There is a connection from this parking area to that trail. Uh, there are people, there's a lot of people that try to get access to the inlet in this area. There's just a lot of people that want to stop and look at the sheep. This is a very popular area for the sheep viewing. It's the most common place where they come based on the, the mineral that's there. And uh, they, uh, you know, it, you can't always control where the sheep are going to be, but this is a very common location for them. Uh, and so it's, 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 there's rock climbing in close proximity to this. We've been working with them to make sure that we're not impacting uh, their, their uh, desirable routes. And uh, it, there's just a lot of different uses in this area. Those recreational users that are trying to access the inlet and the distance from the various parking and the walkways. I mean, I just, is this, is that part of your concern for the trespassing over the railroad? You're trying to divert them under the, on the trail, under the railroad track, but it seems quite a distance. Actually, the people that are accessing the inlet for windsurfing and kite surfing is a very small percentage of the, of the trespassers. The trespassers is, here is the same situation that is at Beluga Point in that the highway is on one side and the point of the rock is on the other side of the tracks and and many people who park at that location walk across the tracks to get out on that rock uh, and, be, and be able to get closer to the water and that's a much higher percentage. The number of people that act the kite surfers and the, and the folks that are trying to get out on the water it's it's really a relative they're more they're a more yeah. visible group probably but they're a much smaller in number and and they are kind of 
it's hard to pinpoint where they're going to be. This is one spot where they access, but it's not necessarily uh, the only spot. So, on, on Tom, would you have anything to add to that? I guess I'd speak to um, the intent is for emergency access. It isn't for private use, uh, public use. That's not what it's intended for. It's far enough away that you aren't going to see uh, kite surfers setting up or windsurfing. It's not conducive to kites, uh, kite boarding. It's not conducive to really for windsurfing. You have to haul your gear too far. The, the unique part of this location is that it's kind of halfway inside the inlet and it usually almost always has water, and which is as we know, with the tides, it drains out, and there's very few locations that you can have like this. So, the fire department is really interested in having this available. And I think anybody who drives along the arm sees the use within the on the water. They're increasing dramatically over the years with the the sups, um, the kite board. I would say there's going to be bollards. It's going to be restricted. There's not going to be a bullet landing. It's not going to be anything. It's, not, it's just for emergency access. And, and two more real quick ones. Okay. The southbound, the parking here on the south side, and they're totally, it's only accessible southbound. You're not going to get cars trying to jump. The, they're, they're not going to have abilities to jump the road and get in and head back to Anchorage. They're going to have to go down and do a U-turn at the other entrance. That is correct. Um, it isn't accessible. I, don't, I think we'll have signage there, regulatory signage to control that. And then the intention is, is that there's, uh, you got the use, even if you miss it going south, you can pull over, go on the north side, um, walk around. It's not that far of a distance. So that is our kind of our intention. And on the other sheet that you had on the northbound, on the north side um, parking, the entry gate seems to be about a 90 degree turn off from the highway. Correct. Is that? It's intentional. We actually, when we first, um, when we were going through different iterations on this, we did have a nice ramp off and all kinds, which seems nice, but from a maintenance standpoint, uh, whether it's plowing snow or controlling access, this is what we, we heard back from our, our folks, um, that they wanted something like, and that also includes the park service, they wanted that. Um, with uh, multiple lanes, we'll have that ability. The one thing that's nice about the way this is set up right now is we can adapt to safety issues if they arise. If we, if there's a need for an additional um, a, a ramp or a turn lane, uh, we can accommodate it. We have that ability. The thing what we're trying to do here, besides fix the safety issues, also correct, make sure that we're accommodating any future needs, that we aren't coming back cutting rock. We work with a, a very significant amount of stakeholders on this, um, from uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife to uh, uh, Fish and Game. So we're trying to pull stuff away from the rock. The reason, from an engineering standpoint, we would have moved in and took out the corner. I mean, from a straight from an engineering standpoint, we would have got, got rock. But uh, based on the feedback we got from the like of fish and game, we, we moved out and, and we have to balance that against the belugas in the water and we got to fit in there, kind of threading the needle, if you will. And last one, that is entry and exit, correct? Yes. The other thing I wanted to say is that we've mimicked this entry and exit. It's very similar to the Turnigan Pass rest area facility, so there's some, some examples and, and there's kind of a little proven history on how it operates, so the department's a little, you know, Familiarity and comfort, comfort with this approach is also proven with by how that one performs. But if you're in that line of traffic and people are slowing down to make that right-hand turn, you're going to get caught. Uh, yes, it's two lanes, but it's still, yes. you get the motorhome traffic. You have a congestion turn point is what you have, though. Uh, Thank you. Again, it does have that ability to adapt to the needs. Ms. Bailey. Uh, through the chair, and uh, thank you for speaking. Um, I had a couple questions. You mentioned that there is going to be room for a bike lane on the north access of this. However, um, when the bike lane starts down in Bird, it's on the south. Is that just kind of delaying an inevitable cost down the line, or what is there a future plan for that, or are we just not dealing with that issue yet? So there is an underpass, I believe, in Indian, correct. That gets you to the north side of the road, and so, I, you know, right, right now we're envisioning that the, if there were a trail, a multi-use pathway on the north side of the road here, between here and Indian, it would be on the north side of the road, and that was that was our philosophy in putting it on the north side of the road. It's it would putting it on the south side would have a much greater impact, and then and then uh, I think it. 
probably get you away from access to the trails and things like that that are on the north side of the road. So that's why we've done that. There is, there is the uh, pedestrian undercrossing here. There's quite a bit of flexibility in how that future trail might be constructed, but we didn't want to put it in a situation where there was, they had to move the road to be able to put a trail in. And so that's why we've accommodated that space on the north side. No, I think that makes sense. Um, another question is, you mentioned that you've been working with the rock climbers, and I'm guessing this is in regards to goat head soup at mile 106.8. Um, I didn't quite hear if there was a resolution on that yet. Have you been able to find a way in which you can maintain those climbing routes? Yes. So th th if, you, if you, I didn't bring a figure that shows all of those routes. But there are, okay, so the Goat's Head Soup routes are largely being intact, the, are remaining intact. The, probably the southernmost routes, there's a couple of them that are like 512, 515 in training, or in, or in, in, uh, in con, almost kind of under construction routes that are listed as being very under, uh, low desirability in the Alaska Climbing Guide. And so those routes, there's actually one of those that will go away. It's within the area that we're showing as being impacted by the construction. But the climbers that we've talked to have, have indicated that that is not a desirable route. And as long as we're preserving the goat's head soup uh, uh, routes, that, that we're on solid ground with them. And then just as a follow-up, I know that one of the reasons that's a desirable climbing area is because it's kind of off. Is the new construction on the north going to be bringing um, traffic to it? It kind of seems actually like what will be happening is the road is getting even further away from the area, so it'll be an even better climbing spot. But I can't quite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. We're aware of it. We're going to do what we can to preserve it. The, as, Steve indica as Steve indicated, the, the best routes are, seem to be around the corner. The ones that are on are noted in the book, but are not climbed very often for a variety of reasons. Um, one of the things is we are separating the road from the rock faces. You, that's, we're doing that in a lot of places. And, and what you've seen in the past where the rock face is real close to the road is not as desirable for a lot of reasons. Rock fall onto the road ice, whatever it might be. So we have that separation, so it will actually create a little better uh, area for potential future climbing. And then just one more, is there any consideration of having pedestrian access there? Is it just kind of assumed that they haven't had it yet as much, and so it'll be similar that the construction area where you're excavating will make it easier to access that area? We're by design. We are creating the space there to allow for a future pathway. Right now, it would be a kind of a trail to nowhere, and we're not. This is a one that we're. The department is doing a lot of work that is almost beyond what we would normally see on a lot of projects. We're doing. Um, we're investing a lot of money in these. Uh, facilities on the side of the road, recognizing, trying to separate the vehicular, fast-moving vehicular traffic with the people that want to view the wildlife, getting them an opportunity along the arm, which is sorely missing right now. We are getting more along there, but this will be one of those places that people will come to because they'll be given an opportunity to view wildlife. All right, thank you. I completely agree. You guys are dealing with a lot of conflicting interests, and I think you guys have done a good job balancing them. Thank you. Steve, you look like you were looking for something, but you're you, you good? Well, I just wanted to, I just didn't have the dimension at my fingertips and I can't find it, but there is a, I just wanted to emphasize that there, this side of the slope, it goes down, uh, down to a kind of like a little swale that's actually a little bit of a wide swale, and that's the rock fall catchment area, and that's specifically been widened out to, it, it'll be fairly level down there, so the climbers can walk right along there. It's, it's not paved, <laughs> but it'll be a nice flat area. It'll be easier to access those trails than it is today, or those climbing routes than it is today. Thank you. Question from Mr. Walker. Uh, I think uh, Mr. Sporhays was going to present John Springs' questions, but he had to leave early, so I've got John's some of John's questions and some of my own here. Um, so the material excavation site 
um, are those are those planned for future straightening projects or I mean they don't seem to correlate they kind of nip the corner off a little bit but they don't seem to correlate to a straightening of either of those corners particularly I mean is there something planned there or a pull out or anything like that or well I guess I'm I'm not you're gonna have to explain a little bit more so the please question, so you're uh, going to extract the riprap out of these mountain sides yep. and and remove a big chunk of the mountain are you going to straighten the road there later like is there another project after this where you're planning to straighten the road out or um to my knowledge there is no uh other project i mean there I, i'm going to back up i don't have knowledge the department does not have any projects i don't believe in the works along here we're doing a lot of different things but i think uh the mile 100 is uh, around india is the next one that's in in the queue for it's being developed um to answer your question about that specific location what we're going to do is make the the site available we're going to do a recognizing the closer you can ha extract material to a project the more economical it is it's pretty simple math it also um in this location it's tough to move how many loads are we talking about it's over 100 150,000 truckloads there, that's a safety issue in its own right so um and clogging them. so the closer proximity we can be to the project it's going to impact the public less so uh typically on department projects we make we may make sites available and i we make the we give the information we make the information available we do not dictate to the contractor that they have to use a particular site in this particular case we are recognizing the difficulty of finding material close proximity and the difficulty of getting it permitted we're doing a lot more work towards that and it's likely that we will use that so there is nothing on the books that says we're straightening that area out what our intention with this project is to extract the material make it reduce the visual impact recognizing the viewscape is a major component of driving along the highway or along the arm rather and trying to preserve that we do recognize 1.8 million yards is not a small hole by any means and and um what i would like to you know what would be nice to in a, maybe in a perfect world would be that there would be climbing routes in that pit afterwards and stuff like that where they could i when we we talk about those sorts of things with the park service they really don't they're right now they're uh, fiscally strapped to maintain what they have so they're not interested in really having a discussion about building up more stuff but it does allow another opportunity um, i just i would share mr walker my perspective is that we are asked to approve in concept or the, in the design study of the roadway itself but i don't feel like there's enough information to evaluate the actual extraction areas i think which is why staff has recommended that they follow a conditional use permit later so i, I just from my perspective and i hope it shows up in findings is that our approval doesn't doesn't say you can do whatever you can you want to do at those extract we just don't have the information what does it look like afterwards what how does it function that's, right that's i think it's more out of curiosity yeah. just yeah. um and and i don't want to beleaguer this point but I, I would be just curious to know can you relate uh the what's this the closer one um, the one that you intend to use the better quality rock in scope and scale to what say like bird creek i mean that's a that's a very big extraction site so is it going to look like that when it's done or um i mean you obviously must have some idea of what the height of that wall is going to be what i would tell you about that material site <clears throat> the one we were considering it will have a conditional use permit which mr robinson spoke to uh also there's a special use permit with the uh with the park that we will be going through that process there's a public process associated with that so it's going to be vetted more and in those kind of details may come be fleshed out at that point right now we have a concept of the size of a hole we are going to make there uh, to in the amount of material we need for a particular this size project and trying to vet it that way so um, i'm going to move on to john's questions here um so he would like to his first question is with regard to the material extraction sites and whether they were um, taken into consideration in the noise analysis um and he thought that the proximity of one of the sites was uh, seemed relatively close to rainbow <clears throat> so this particular project uh had a different type of noise study than is typically with probably what you're accustomed to seeing this was primarily a noise study that was driven by the impacts to the beluga 
and to determine what kind of, uh, of uh, monitoring would need to occur during construction. Uh, the, the material sites were also evaluated as far as the, the blasting and their effects on the beluga whales. Uh, from, a, from a noise impact to the rainbow community, the rainbow, uh, the rainbow homes uh, are far enough away from, from the site that they are going to be outside the they're going to be outside the noise contours that would, and particularly since they're, they're sheltered from the, much of the noise by, by the mountain itself. Yes, there will, I'm not saying there won't be any noise impacts, but it, uh, the blasting and uh, those effects sound much worse when you say them than when you actually think about where they are. Just the, the same, as if, same, same impacts to the Turnigan Arm Trail. It's 500 feet away from this location. Uh, we, we, we did see John's comments earlier today, so I can answer that one in advance. Uh, the Turning Arm Trail is about 500 feet away. As we go through the conditional use permit, I'm sure there'll be additional questions regarding that material side, and we can, we can address the, those issues at that time. But the, the noise study that was done for this project was primarily driven by, by the impacts to the, the critical habitat and not necessarily to individual homes. Okay. The, the density of homes in this area is is uh, relatively small and they're far enough away that, that they didn't meet the criteria for having to do a noise study. Okay. Um, so you saw his comments, so you obviously know that um, there's at least two or three more questions regarding these material sites. <laughs> <laughs> um, so he's asking if the material extraction site uh, included in the 4F analysis, or was it included in the 4F analysis, and is there no reasonable alternative? Um, I mean, I feel like you've covered some of that here tonight. I'm, I feel like that. So the 4F that. process is an FHWA process, and we have to get this project approved through the Federal Highways Administration, and we'll work, we'll work through them to make sure it's approved. And if, if we can't, uh, if, if they don't approve it, then the project won't move forward. Uh, did you see his question about the cost delta between sourcing material from a different location in this? Is that even quantified at this point? Or? It is quantified. We've done an analysis, as I said, we've done a thorough analysis of the material sites from Portage through the valley, and the next, the next closest site uh, is about 30 to 40 million dollars more for the transportation cost of the material to get to the site over over the exist over the estimated cost for using this location, so it's it's a significant increase in cost. Okay. The the exact number was that it aver the other sites averaged thirty eight million dollars more for our construction budget than this one. Okay. Uh, and what was the t what's the total cost of the rock? Just out of curiosity, the riprap for the. Off the top of my head, I can't remember. Okay. Uh, I mean, I'm just checking. <laughs> Thirty million. million. I mean, I was yard. doing the math. I bought a lot of riprap, and so I, I was doing the math in my head. What I pay for riprap, and I was like, well, well, the fifty million. The transportation know. costs more than the actual extraction process does when you start moving right. that further away. And so, instead of six or seven dollars a cubic yard, we're at twenty-five dollars a cubic yard. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that sounds more like it. <clears throat> um, you should go to Skookum. Get it there. Uh, we looked at that. <laughs> I'm sure you did. So one of John's questions was uh, he wanted to know what evidence there was that accidents occurred due to conflicts with wildlife viewers. So the, 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 there was a traffic analysis completed, as, completed for the project that evaluated uh, and there's a, this corridor has had an extensive traffic and safety analysis and uh, as part of the safety corridor designation. And uh, this, particular, this particular corridor is, you know, what we've done is we've, not, we've shown. Steve, can I, get you on, can I get you on the mic for the record? Thanks. Sure. So just to give you an idea of how, you know, made, we, because of the safety corridor designation, this is one of the, one of the driving factors between, behind all of the improvements on the Seward Highway. Between Anchorage and, and Girdwood, uh, we all read about the accidents that occur. And, uh, uh, and so to try to get some idea of, 
of what kind of problems that we can help solve with this project. Uh, you can see on this, you can see on this chart how this mile post that we're talking about are some of the higher locations for fatal and major injuries. It's it's not the highest two mile stretch, but it's close to the highest two mile stretch, and you can compare that with areas of the highway that are that are four lane, uh, and uh, and you can see the red the red there indicates the fatalities, and the and the yellow there is the major injury crashes over the last 40 years, and. Uh, uh, um, tracked by two mile segment of highway. And so the curvature of the highway between mile 100 to 111 um, and the relatively limited space has led to that area being the higher area for fatal and major injury accidents. There's just less margin for error. And, uh, and so that's part of what's driving this project. Now, specific accidents, do I know exactly how many accidents per year are caused by people slowing down? No, because the first of all, the troopers don't, they don't give us that kind of detail in their accident reports. We don't know if somebody slowed down and caused the accident all the time, and we and we sometimes we might, but 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 crashes are often influenced by a variety of factors, and it's it's really impossible for me to answer that question any more specifically than I than I am. We we can provide you with the crash data, and uh, if that's what if that's the desires of the commission, we can provide John with the crash data, and, and it's it is in the design study report in the appendix, and he's welcome to to read that and give us his comments. Sure. So there is a safety corridor designation on the highway, and. The safety corridor designation has it was implemented in 2006 and 2007, uh, and it has. There's three E's for of engineer of uh, of uh, uh, for highways. It's engineering, education, and enforcement. Uh, the safety corridor designation is tackling the in, the education and enforcement sides of of the highway safety, while the engineering side of things can catch up to it. There's just not enough money to fix all of the safety problems. And so the education and the enforcement side of things has has helped and it, it, it those two things will always help. They will help every stretch of highway and and, and when, we, when we target those things at our greatest safety problems, they will definitely help. And we've seen state uh, on the five or six quarter uh, safety quarter designations there's been anywhere from 35 to 60 percent reduction in overall crashes uh, those measures are temporary though because they fade over time as as the impact of the enforcement as the impact of the educational outreach decreases then people tend to get back to their old old uh, habits and as there's not enough money for to keep up that enforcement, uh, the engineering measures are the long-term permanent solution. And those safety measures, those d highway safety corridor designations, can go away once those uh, once the engineering measures are implemented. And the perfect example of that is the Parks Highway from Wasilla to Big Lake, which is now four lanes, and the safety corridor designation is re being removed from that highway in 2016. So a the, the, these, those safety corridor designations are just that. They're viewed as, as interim safety measures. I will point out that, it, that sadly, the safety corridor designation has, has reduced the overall crashes on the Seward Highway, but the fatalities in that same time period is actually not reduced. So am I telling you that the safety corridor designation has increased fatalities? No. Uh, one thing doesn't necessarily equal another, but it goes to show that that, that fatalities are are influenced by a variety of factors, and and when we and when we draw conclusions of the data, we need we need a we need a long period of time to be able to draw meaningful answers that help us get get to a safer facility that all of us would like to see here. So. Um I think John Scott, some of his one question was answered by the chart um, talking about locations of, you know, that have the most need. Um, and then just, I'll get it on the record, and I know you guys are tired of listening to John's questions here, but, um, 
you know, I think what he, my question, my first question, and what his, one of his final questions here was, was really just the thought that if you're going to extract that much material out of a corner, it kind of makes sense to do it from a corner that you're going to work on later anyways. So I think that was the gist of it. I'm not going to, I'm not going to ask you to speak to that, but in my mind, it seems like it makes sense to plan ahead a little bit, and and um, even if you have to go a little bit farther down the road, to go to 103 and 105 and find the worst corner there and take all the, you know, get the rock out. And, and I know it's not that easy, but anyway, I think that's what he was he was getting at. So, thank you, appreciate it. Thanks, Brandon. A question from Miss Barker. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I'm looking at the. Um, the staff report and the recommendation concerning the alteration of the design for the retaining and rockery walls. And I'd like to hear your your reaction to that requirement, the seismic issue. My reaction is that we will, um, before we stamp the drawings, we will develop structural calculations that justify our design, or we will change it. Uh, at, I don't. I can't sit here and tell you exactly how we're going to change it in response to that comment. I did see the comment, but I haven't. Uh, but it's it's as the engineer of record, it's our job to make sure that the the design standards and the codes are met, and we and we will do that. I mean, it's a geologically complex area and seismically active, as we all know. Uh, Correct. And you know, specifies here that the the condition is that the amended design shall conform to the design criteria manual be approved by Building Safety. So this is a State Department of Alaska. I see dueling engineers happening here. Yeah. Well, well, the it's not dueling engineers; it's dueling agencies, and it's really a Department of Transportation and Public Facilities project design. You know, the comment, to, in my mind at least, my client is the Department of Transportation, and I'm going to use. It, I'm going to meet their design criteria. That's what. That's what I have to design the road to is Ashto, and to the state pre-construction manual, and. And those things will meet the the uh, state structural codes as well. So the design so the only part I don't agree with necessarily is that I have to design to the design criteria manual because the design criteria manual has no bearing from our perspective on this project. It's that's a municipal adopted document, and as long as we meet the pre-construction manual, uh, then we're going to be in compliance with what, with the codes and what's necessary on this project. Otherwise, we will be we but we will be designing the project to meet current standards and to meet structural standards and seismic design, and we're trying to come up with something. Uh, and, and frankly, we haven't spent a whole lot of time designing the rockery walls yet because we don't even have a an agreement from the Department of Natural Resources and Chugach State Park that they're going to maintain those facilities yet, and until we have that maintenance agreement in place, we're not going to spend a lot of time designing and doing the details on something that might go away. We may just be designing the highway and not, and not putting in those recreational facilities. If there's no maintenance agreement, then those two facilities will not be part of the project. And so we haven't spent a lot of time on those elements of the design yet because we don't want to have to, we, don't, we, we have other parts of the project that are more important for us uh, in the short term. Am I misreading the site plan then? Because it does show a retaining wall protecting the um, the railroad. It does. It does have one, and, which and is a necessary public infrastructure. It is, but it's it's shown there, but it's not necessarily finished design. We're still very conceptual. We're still very early in the process, and there are things that we can do to a rockery wall, and still have it be vertical that aren't necessarily going to be shown in concepts. We can put tiebacks and straps in them. There's things that we can do to make that same concept happen and meet the structural and seismic code. It, it just means we're doing it in a different way, and, and those details get fleshed out as we get further along in the project. I'm not real familiar with the AASHTO requirements. Um, is there a variation in the AASHTO requirements depending upon the seismic risk of the, um, of, of the area? No. So they don't vary from, say, Mississippi to California to Alaska. Ashto is a national standard. I'm aware of that. Okay. Yeah. So the, the seismic standards are governed by which what your seismic zone that you're in. Okay. Alaska's that's, in that's what I was Alaska's in zone four, 
and just like California, and so we have to design to zone four seismic standards. So there is a specific AASHTO seismic standard for it, this it, area of it's risk. Not, it's not AASHTO, it's, it's the Uniform Building Code. Okay, I'm sorry, I was making that separation. Yeah. AASHTO is a highway, a highway, Correct. national I, highway. Correct, I, I understand yeah. that. Um, another question I had, Mr. Chair. Sure. Um, we may have brought this up, but I want to bring it up again. When I look at the notion that we're actually creating here potentially a very attractive um, tourist amenity, that's not necessarily a bad thing. And you likened it to being very similar to the one at Turnigan Pass, which I think most all of us are very familiar with. Um, obviously, your design anticipates that large buses will be using this. And I'm wondering about I guess I'm uncomfortable with, to me, is an inherent risk of large tour buses making a left-hand turn into this amenity, as well as making a turn back out of it to continue on their way. We don't see much of that on Turnigan Pass because the, you know, the wildlife viewing, it isn't quite as attractive and they're kind of on their way to go to and from Seward. But this, I'm a little concerned about how, how you perceive that working and what you feel the um, potential usage might be for large um, tour bus vehicles. Yeah. So I can tell you my observations. Uh, based on the design process, there has been a lukewarm reception from the tour operators mm. relative to this project. This was not driven by uh, Holland America or Princess <laughs> or anybody trying to have another place that they can pull people, uh, turn, uh, turn out and, and have people enjoy the view. Uh, and, and in fact, we've actually been told by the tour operators that if they were to use it, that it requires them to pay Chugach State Park an additional, uh, essentially a head tax for every, t every time they pull off into these turnouts uh, for, their, for the use of these. And so the more of these they pull off, the less, the less profits that they have. And so there's, they, if they pull off here, they might not pull off somewhere else. Um, but that being said, we're not designing this for tour operators. We've had only peripheral discussions with, with them to, to see if, to gauge their interest. And when it was lukewarm, we really did not try to do anything specific to provide space for them or to provide a large tour uh, bus, uh, bus parking area. We are designing it for a comparable uh, number of visitors who would go to say Beluga Point or to Bird Point. DNR does keep track of the number of visitors that attend those two locations and we are designing a comparable number of spaces and, and capacity. Uh, a, a tour bus or a large RV is our design vehicle. They really have a similar, yes. a similar design radius and so that, that really is kind of how we're looking at this. We're not necessarily trying to create this destination tourist location, but, but it, will be, it will be a location that, that does draw the people that currently stop on the highway and want to go here. Uh, and, and it will be a safer location where they can get off the highway. We're largely trying to separate uses. We've got a lot of people that stop on the highway going slowly, uh, and we've got people that want to just get to the Kenai Peninsula. And so we're trying to separate those people that are 20, 30 miles per hour difference on the highway. Thank you. Mr. Walker, and then I have a question. Sorry, me again. Um, Commissioner Strike would like to know if you guys have any funding for this project yet. <laughs> He's like he didn't ask any. Nice job. Um, it off on anybody. Do, uh, <laughs> The this is a very large project. It, it's upwards of uh, eighty million dollars. Um, what I would say is it's a combination of state and federal. We're moving ahead. Um, it's planned for. It's in our stip. It's um, it's also has go bonds, uh, GF bonds. We nobody or I should say everybody knows the fiscal situation of the state or at least they hear peripherally uh, what's going on there um, this is a very important project it's still on the books as such and as project manager we're still moving ahead with everything so I would say yes um, Construction is, was, in, I say was, uh, is envisioned for next spring but that's dependent on 
a lot of things, and that's depend on us, our ability to get the permits, whether it's conditional or special use permits, from and work through that process. So um, we have some challenges in front of us, but uh, it is planned for uh, next spring, and that may get pushed out as uh, more information comes available. A couple of questions, um, and hopefully we can wrap up. But we, we talked, Danielle was asking you questions about the, the separated pathway, and I think, <clears throat> I think I heard that the door is open for a separated pathway that extends the bird to gird trailhead and I, you, you, at some point in the future. I'd like a little discussion of that as you move forward. I'd like to see that, that notion somehow. And I didn't see any of that in the narrative, but I think that's an important issue to, to carry forward if, in fact, knowing that the DOT is committed to helping with, one, with that type of amenity, I think is important to me as we look at a, a holistic you know, system in place. So, Steve, you, you responded that it's, we're looking at a chunk and it's doable. But, again, I'd, I'd just like to see that moving forward. Um, the the uh, the other one though is uh, we see both you know I take my family on the separated pathway but I see a lot of cyclists that that bike the the roadway itself and the shoulder could you address the uh, the amenity the 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 shoulder width the the designs of the pulling in and turning out and the whatever we're calling it the accessory lane or this you know and how that would work with a with a uh, a cyclist. Well, in that particular area, we are promoting or constructing, uh, I guess on the typical, you saw eight foot shoulders on the outside. Um, right now, that's narrower, and plus they have that rumble strip in there. I used to bike a lot along the arm. I don't anymore. I, for, for, that rumble strip probably did me in yeah, more than well, anything. I, I mean, I just wonder um, if we're making it better or worse. I mean, that's No, I, I would say that the geometry, the sight distances increased, the shoulder width has increased. We're doing things that make sense. We're, we're making a, we're accommodating the pathway, even though we may not be showing the pathway, we're, get, we're allowing room there for a future pathway. And I think that in a place where we have to move mountains to make things happen, it, it's very important for us to at least accommodate. So we aren't back there cutting uh, rock slopes at a later date uh, for, say, a pathway or another lane or anything. So we're trying to make those accommodations. Uh, the approach, I mean, I would love to see a pathway that ran all the way from town. I personally would love to see a pathway that ran all the way from town all the way to uh, Girdwood, and I think uh, people would appreciate that, but that uh, we're in the business of moving vehicular traffic, and that's what we're working on first. Well, I, I beg to differ with you a little bit. I believe okay. that Federal Highway money funds all modes of transportation. And yeah, I, that's I, true. And I want yeah. to tell you that the reason you're here is in is in fact because we have comprehensive planning documents and our plan documents do actually talk about the notion of a continuous pathway. So uh, I know we all feel like the burden falls on all of us and unjustly, and I know that's well, your perspective as DOT, but you are gonna be the driver that gets it done or not, or puts a, mm -hmm. you know, puts an obstacle in the way and we go back later. And, and I guess yeah. that leads me to my final comment. Um, you know, Steve, we've seen you here a couple of times. This is not just this project. This is sort of indicative of all road projects. We don't look at the whole system. We look at a chunk at the time. And I think it's very frustrating to the public and, and to me personally to understand how does it all fit together. And so I understand when we do capital projects, especially an $80 million two-mile project, that we have to chunk up the capital. But I don't understand why we have to continue to chunk up to sort of how that the the holistic how the heck does this thing work from potter to indian or whatever we're gonna to bird whatever we're gonna do and i i don't know how to get us there but it's and it's not just state the city does it the same way whether it's turnigan street and turnigan boulevard and we punt it down the road and then we're left with building facilities that don't necessarily connect or make sense and so i wonder if you could just address that that, that frustration that I have. We have a, a planning section that does the planning of things like you're talking about, long-range transportation plans. Um, I think it's frustrating for us as engineers too when we don't have a document that uh, allow, point, we can point to to divide. Because if you look at this from Anchorage to Girdwood or something short of that, you're looking at a mega project of sorts. You're looking at somewhere less than a billion dollars when you look at all the rock and all the work that would have to be done. It's a huge project. 
Um, how do we do the planning you're referring to? I'm talk to the planning department. Well, no, I mean, and, and, and it echoed back to, you know, what I think um, Brandon was talking about. Maybe this was Greg talking about it, but the, you know, we're, we're talking about potential conditional use sites for resource extraction for this project. It's not going to be the end of it. And so in the absence of knowing where are we going to get all the rock and where are we going to get all the cuts for the whole thing, Right, it's hard to evaluate. What are we left at with at the end of it from a scenic byway and, and a, you know, and an attraction standpoint? That's where I think I totally get the scale of it and the magnitude of it. You're not going to make it one project, but can we think about it more holistically than than we're doing here today? Um, and and, ha and 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 when you come in for that conditional use permit, we're going to say the same thing. You know, we're, 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 okay, is this it? Where's the next one? Where's the next one? We're just going to pick our way, you know, in 10 mile increments until we do have a Bird Creek, you know, type facility, you know, spaced out pretty regularly. So I know that's not just solely within your purview, gentlemen. I, I, I get that, but um, it, it's what our body is supposedly here to do is try to keep an eye on, on you know, on, the, on how it all ties together. So uh, with that, I see no other questions in the queue. Thank you for your presentation and your testimony. What is the will of the body? And just for reminder's sake, we are generally asked to approve with, uh, with the staff conditions and or additional questions or suggestions that we have uh, moving forward uh, with, a, with a specific request to either um, recommend the, the, the alternative suggested, which of course is either a no build or what was presented here this evening. Mr. Strike. I'll take the stab at it. In the matter of case 2016-0066, I move for approval with the notes of conditions as noted by the staff and that we accept this proposal, this, this plan. Thank you, Mr. Strike. Is that uh, okay with you, Mr. Walker, as a second? Okay, is there any discussion? My point is I, I'm going to vote for that approval on this plan. I think it's refreshing that we have the detail that we were provided here by the state on this as we've asked in the past and I applaud them for being ahead of the power curve on the presentation here. I note that the chair's consideration for additional view regarding the bicycle and the, what we look for in the future is noted. Um, and what I mean by looking forward as we look for other projects of this type along the corridor that we have a plan forward for the resource access, the pits, borrow pits, so to speak, for the um, projects. But again, I applaud the state for their timeliness and putting this out in the manner we have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Strike. Ms. Bailey. I am also going to be voting uh, for approval of this as well. Uh, I believe that they had a tough job in front of them as far as balancing the environmental considerations with the view shed and with especially monitoring safety. This is something that um, there's just too many deaths and too many injuries that happen along this corridor. However, I am disappointed that uh, certain things were kicked down the line. Um, I agree that we need to start looking at longer range solutions here having a bike path that ends on the south side of a road and then having room for a bike path on the north side of the road here and then not knowing how we're connecting it. We're just, inevitably we're gonna have to build a tunnel if there's a connected bike path, which is in our long range plan that is something that the city of Anchorage um, wants. And so those types of things not being even, um, a solution doesn't need to be had today, but I think recommendations and ideas and suggestions for those should be on the table and so that's kind of disappointing but on the whole I believe that a lot of hard factors were weighed and balanced here and that a good solution is being proposed. 
Um, thank you, Ms. Bailey. Yeah, I, I'm also going to support um, the notion. I think it's clearly a hard task. It's a hard engineering feat. It's incredibly costly. Um, but we know the, the problems associated um, with the road, and, and I frankly nearly watched an accident yesterday on my way back from the, from the Kenai. I think we have a comprehensive plan that balances the need to make these um, safety improvements with other important core values. And, I'll, and let, me, let me read some of them, paraphrasing some of the elements in the, in the, in the Turning an Arm Comprehensive Plan, which again is very clear on supporting safety upgrades to the Seward Highway. But it also talks about these, these transportation improvements that are compatible with community core values, protecting scenic views, minimizing noise in residential areas, and minimizing, minimizing light pollution, ensuring that there are other environmental safeguards um, in those highway upgrades, um, that we include more rest stops and pullouts and alleviate traffic volumes, and ultimately, um, that we also ensure that road projects do not adversely impact land values, public access, pedestrian safety, or commercial land uses in the area. I think it, it, it does an adequate job of balancing most of these. I think that, as always, the devil's in the details, and as you move forward, that's what will be looked at. Um, but again, I, I just would make a strong finding here that in the, in the future, we really need to know how it all fits together in, the, in future projects, and, and, uh, and what can we be doing um, to ensure that we don't redo something because I think that's the worst thing we face as agents of the public or public agencies ourselves is having to go back and do it over again. It's not a place we want to be. So uh, with that, everyone please uh, vote on the matter at hand. Uh, the matter passes unanimous, unanimously. Good job. Thank you. Thank you all for coming as well. I'm sorry this was uh, not a public hearing, but hopefully you learned a little something. Uh, there is a, a next step that would go again to the Urban Design Commission, which would be a much more detailed report. And then as you heard here, our recommendation is that they move forward with a conditional use permit with any of the resource extraction sites that are proposed, which would, uh, which would include public hearing um, at this uh, at this action and generally also uh, ask for some input from turning and armed community councils too so with that mr. Walker has a motion to adjourn I see no objection the meetings adjourned thank you <laughs>